Good evening, and thank you. I, I'm not sure if you're hearing me well. Yes, yes we're hearing you. Okay, we're great. Hearing. Um, you yes, you, you, you got a lot of it right. I'm no longer with JTS, though. Um, as of Christmas of last year, uh, I now focus on church development, and um, that's what that's what my main thing is now, okay. church development. So I, I am, um, I am all over the place, all over the mm -hmm. place, including pastor our own church. Yes. So, just to bring you up to date. Just to bring you Thank up. You. Thank you. All right. Your pastor asked me to talk to about, talk about um the distinction between Israel and the church. The, the the struggle is that you know um I remember when I went to Bible school for the first time. Uh this was at undergrad level. My very first assignment was to write on the distinction between the church and Israel. And that came like three weeks with my being in Bible school. I had no clue what they were talking about. For my entire time in church, I've never heard that before. Nobody ever said to me, Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. There are two distinct um, groups of people. There are two distinct times. There are two distinct covenants. There are two distinct um people of God in specific times, didn't know the Old Testament was, was primarily to them and all of that. I just thought that the Bible started from beginning to end on the church, had no clue. I mean, you see Israel, but there is nobody who said to me that there's a distinction. And so that first paper that I had I struggled over it, even though it was supposed to be just four pages long. It is the longest four pages I've ever written, I mean, in time. It took me weeks to get the paper. And then at the end of the paper, I was so unsure of what I said. I put a footnote in it to the professor. Um, this information, um, I was led by God. <laughs> of course, that don't matter to them. And it didn't count. Um, and since then, I've had um, this burning quest to find out what's the distinction and, and what it means. It Over time, it became very clear, very, very clear um, that there are distinctions within the scripture. It especially became clear when we were doing um, apocalyptic literature, meaning the second coming there are, there are scripture verses there that the church have taken to itself that doesn't belong to church. And um, there was a big, big struggle for me understanding this because those kind of distinctions were never made. And when I began to read the scripture, study the scripture in light of being a, 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 a student of the word, those things really shocked me that nobody was talking about them. So I need to give kudos to your pastor and your church for having this talk on the distinction of the church and Israel. Now, there are lots, there, there is a theology out there that is called um, replacement theology, where people take the, 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 the promises of Israel and try and make it applicable to the church. But there is no such thing. Let me give you some of them that are commonplace in the church that we talk about. We talk about the one in Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then I will hear and heal their land. And I can't begin to tell you how many churches have heard that from the pulpit um, being proclaimed and and I'm saying, well, you know, um, these distinctions need to be made so that the church can understand what its true calling and purpose is. The, the, the fact is that the church don't have any land promise. We are never called towards any land promise. Israel has a land promise. I'm going to talk about these things, the distinctions that, that lead to that. Um, in Matthew chapter 25, 
uh, where Jesus speaks to the disciples regarding the second coming, we have taken so much of that and made it the church when it does belong to the church. It's not a promise to the church. It does not concern the church. As a matter of fact, most of the things, times when those things will happen, the church will not be here. Church would have gone long ago. And so we end up teaching things like, and saying things like, well, you know, um, it's the last days because we can see all of what God says was going to happen, happening. Well, that's not true because God never told us anything regarding the church and what would happen. The church would be taken without warning. Sound of a trumpet and we'll be gone. That's it. There's nothing else that that comes before that. If, if that was so, then the call could not have been imminent. It couldn't be that he could come at any time. Why? Because then he would have to go through those things that he said would happen before. So there are things like that that we're going to be challenged with. And again, when we start making promises that was given to Abraham and to the children of Israel, and we start making it to the church because we see where Paul says we are in graft. We're not in graft in the promises, um, in, in, in that kind of promise, land promise and nation promise and all of that. We are the church. And God says of us that we are sojourners. We don't belong to this world, first and foremost. So we have no land. And he also says of us that he's gone to prepare a place for us, that where he is, we might be there. Israel has to have a fulfillment of land promise. And so I watch with, um, I just watch with concern because I'm not one to always attach uh, current happenings to future happenings and say, okay, this is coming to pass. No, I'm not one like that. But I am looking with concern to see what's happening with Israel and the war in Hamas, no, and Hamas right now because a big part of this war is the fact that the Palestinians are on Temple Mound. They have um, a mosque there. But the Bible promises that you know, the temple is going to be rebuilt. It's said throughout the Bible that Israel will again occupy the land, the temple would rebuilt, be, be rebuilt, and all of those things will come to pass. So um, I watch with anticipation. I don't think that this is, I don't say this is what is happening. I just look. And I know that the push largely, even though it's political in some instances, there is also the thought of getting back to the temple mount because Israel don't have a temple and the Lord promises them that they will have a temple. David will be vice regent and that sacrifice will be offered in the temple again. Anyhow, we're talking about Israel and the church. So there are two um, dates that are important to Israel and to the church. The first day is May 24, AD 33. And that marked the spiritual birth of the church in Jerusalem. How do we know that? Because it was a Pentecost celebration. And it is a simple matter of tracing back the time that Jesus Christ died and the Pentecost celebration that occurred right after. It was right at Pentecost that this happened. Somebody has a hand up. Somebody. No, sir, not as it. Not as oh, it. No, it's not a hand that I see there. Okay. Um, so um it's easy to trace it back. March May 24th, AD 33. And then the second day that is important in the historical development of both of these is May 14th, 1948. And what is that? That is marked as a national rebirth of Israel in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv. I see hands going up. No, I, I just I just raised. Okay. Three, previously, we were encouraged to wait until after you have delivered your lecture before yes. we started questioning. But if you are interested in taking questions as you proceed, you can let us know. And I'm sure others will be willing to raise their hands as you go along. 
All right. Give me a little time to start then. So at least you have something to question about. Um, if you have any questions right now, then just write it down. Give me about 10 minutes and then you can start asking the questions. Please feel, please feel free. I have no problems in answering, if I can, the questions. Um, so uh, 1948, May 14th, is the National Rebirth of Israel in Tel Aviv. What is that? Well, Israel as a nation no longer existed soon after Christ's death. He had foretold that the temple was going to be um, destroyed. Um, the, the, the king, um, Axerxes, came and he profaned the temple and he burned the temple to the ground and the temple was looted and, the, the, you know, the gold and all the precious stones were taken and Israel, Judah, went into captivity. So that was after the rebuilding of of Herod's temple. Herod's temple was the final temple that was built before it was destroyed. They've had several, several crusades um, by the early church to try and retake Israel, um, Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple and give back to Israel. Several crusades. And none of them worked. They they all ended up at def in defeat sometime or the other. So what is happening? Israel as a nation did not exist up until 1948. When that happened, they were dispersed. And that's why we talk about diaspora um, or diaspora. Um, Israel dispersed. It was not the first time. It happened before when um, Israel was invaded by, 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 um, not Babylon, Assyria, when when Israel, there was a division after, um, and I'm trying to do this as quickly as possible. There was a division that happened after Solomon died. Solomon's son took the throne, but his son didn't listen to the elders at the time, and he put in his own leadership and everything. And what happened as a result of that was that 10 of the nations removed themselves from under Solomon's son authority. And it became a divided nation. And then there was Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin, by this time, was a half tribe, not much of a tribe, because if you remember, Benjamin was a tribe where um, the, the, the godly man was moving through the town with his concubine. And they came and they, they wanted to have sexual relations with the man. And his host said, put out here, he put out his concubine to preserve them. And they raped her and then raped her to death. And then he um, cut her into several pieces, put her on asses, and sent her throughout the tribes of Israel. Um, when that happened, um, they united against uh, the tribe of Benjamin, wanting to punish the guys who did this thing. And Benjamin refused to allow them to come in and punish Anybody, Benjamin says, listen, we will deal our own thing. You don't need to be here. And you can read this in the book of Chronicles and so forth. And when Benjamin did that, Israel went to war against them. Benjamin started defending themselves, won the first couple of battles, but then God gave them over into Israel. And there was a time when Israel had to be sending men in to the women of Benjamin so that they could have a tribe. So Benjamin was, was significantly weakened. So when you say, when we read that Judah was left um, with Benjamin, Benjamin was a, a, a quarter tribe, you know, a half tribe, wherever you want to put it, but they were not at full strength. Then um, with the split, several kings came over the Northern side, which was the other 10 um, tribes. And the southern side, which was Judah and Benjamin, under different rulership, they had several different prophets. Not all the prophets that you read about spoke to Judah, and not all of them spoke to Israel. They were contemporaries, many of them, but they didn't share where they were speaking to. And God brought Israel into judgment. The Assyrians judged them. You might remember that famous prophet who kept saying to God, God, why are you not doing something? I keep telling people that you're going to judge and you have not done anything. 
And God said, well, I'm going to do something, but I don't want to tell you because if I tell you, you know, you're going to be angry or you're not going to believe. And that was when the Assyrians came and took Judah into captivity afterwards. Um, the, the Babylonians, sorry, came, the Chaldeans came and took um, Judah. So the two tribes at some stage or the other no longer existed in the land. We read that with Ezra and Nehemiah, some of them came back and they came back to Jerusalem. So in fact, the 10 tribes were never restored to the land, not really. And Judah just barely existed because from then on, Judah would fall under captivity. First by the, the, the Babylonians, then the, 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 the Greeks, and then, um, uh, Lord, it slips me. Those two, two nations that came together and finally by Rome. And then finally this judgment came and they were cast out. So then all of this happened and there was, Israel did not exist from then on. There was no nation called Israel. And in, in the, the world war with Hitler, when I said to people, the world war with Hitler, um, when Hitler was killing the um, six million Jews, the world didn't respond to the plight of Israel. And what happened was that um, Israel um, determined, those who were believers from Israel after the war, that we will go back. And this must never happen again. It must never happen again that Israel needs help. And there's nobody to help her. Israel will help itself. So Israel came back and you can read the history of it and what happened and how many nations approved of them and the wars that came and the struggle they had to become a nation. They were um, had their declaration of being a nation on this day, May 14th, 1948. All right. So the first view, the first events, supports the view that the church is neither a continuation nor a replacement of Old Testament Israel. The second event um, supports the view that God is not finished with Old Testament Israel because God restored them. So we will talk about the circumstances and the implications for each one of these days. So we have a problem where both covenant theology and replacement theologians teach that the church has become God's elect people instead of Israel. The church is the elect of God, but so too is everyone that is chosen by God. This is not the case. The church is the elect. Israel continues to be the elect people of God. And we're going to have the different arguments that will support it. The first one is that the promises are different, and we touched on that a little bit. The promises and provisions that concerns Israel were basically earthly in scope. Earthly in scope. I just told you one, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then I will hear, hear from heaven and I will heal their land. The Christian, the Christians is not a nation, but a people. We are selected from all over the world from different nations. Israel stands as a nation and continues, despite all that has happened, to be regarded as Israelis. Wherever they are, they are regarded as Israelites. So the promises are different. The first one, Exodus 15, 26, and Deuteronomy 28, he says, if you are diligent, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. The promises of the church are different. They are basically heavenly in scope. Ephesians 1, Colossians 3, 1 to 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. No land promise, no land blessing. If then you were raised in Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So there is the distinct difference that God has called us not to be thinking about the earth, not to focus on what is happening here, but our minds should be focused on heavenly things. That's where, that's where our promises are. And that's why we look forward to going to be with him and that sort of thing. So Israel has an earthly promise. The church does not, clearly. The seed is different. Abraham's physical seed refers to Israel. Romans 9, Paul makes that very clear. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Romans 9 verse 7. So Paul makes the distinction that Israel is a seed of Abraham, but it's not all of Abraham's children that are the seed of promise. Isaac is. And then Isaac has two sons, but one is the seed. So the seed, Israel, is from a direct lineage from Abraham and Isaac. The seed is different. Abraham's spiritual seed refers to the church. Therefore, Galatians 3 verse 7, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. So they, this is where the church is now engrafted into the promise to become sons of God. Those are the promises that we come into, the spiritual promises. So Galatians 3 verse 7 tells us that. The births are different. You, you can start asking questions whenever you're ready. Israel celebrated its, its birth at the base of Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 and 20. The church celebrated its birth at Pentecost, Acts 2. The author of Hebrews brings out the great contrast between these two entities. Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. You would need to, to go read that afterwards. Israelites became what they were by physical birth. Believers become what they are by spiritual birth. The nationality is different. Israel belonged to this earth and the world system. The church is composed of all nations. It has no citizenship on earth. Its members are described, and I said it before, as strangers and pilgrims. First Peter 2.11, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly loss which war against the soul. So we are sojourners. We are not of this world. We are passers through. While Israel has a distinct promise that is a land promise. And you can, you know, we, we see that, that God promised them this land. It was taking them to a place that they had not planted, but they would reap from that they had not built, but they would enjoy the benefits of that. And we remember that when they left um, Egypt to go into this land, and this land is, was new to them because Abraham for some time had entered into the land before Abraham was called to the place of promise. If you remember, and then when Abraham got there, he was very disappointed because the place of promise didn't look very promising. In fact, the Bible describes it as a dry and barren place. That's how the Bible, the name that the Bible ascribes to it, it means that it was dry and barren. But how could God promise him a place that was plentiful and fruitful and good for cattle and gave him so much cattle and then send him to a dry and barren place? Because God wanted Abraham to recognize it is he who provides and not his surrounding. Part of the whole thing was that Abraham got, um, he offered sacrifice and everything and then got up and left. 
went over to Egypt while the land was better there. And what happened? Abraham got into trouble. And when he got into trouble over in Egypt, he ended up um, giving away his wife. Many of you might remember that, where he gave his wife to the king. And it is God who intervened and saved that day. So Israel had a beginning and Israel has land promise. Yes. Yes, Pastor, that is me. Um, you, you had made a distinction about the land promise, which I wanted to clarify. Yeah. Um, you refer specifically to the passage that if my people were called by my name. That's one like, of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. As being a land promise. Mm -hmm. However, as far as I can, as far back as I can remember, the church has adopted this particular passage to suggest its benefits for them. Is there no basis on which they should do so? Not as a land, because we are all from different lands. So which land is he going to bless? Which land is he going to bless? Well, I understand your question, but then if I am here in Jamaica, I refer mm -hmm. to that promise because of the state of Jamaica to, to say that if we here as a church mm -hmm. should go to him in full obedience and supplication, then he will heal Jamaica. Where do we see that? When you go to that passage, it was a direct pa a promise to Solomon, who was then being made head of the nation. And he said to God, what if, if we behave, if we live as we should, as righteous people, if we submitted ourselves to you, then heal the land, then bless us, then do all of this for us. But if not, then the land would come into judgment. No. How would Christians, which land would come into judgment because of, of, of the church? Well, we, uh, we, including myself, have taken it to mean that here in Jamaica, where we are extremely disgusting as a people we are violent and sinful that our land would be under judgment because of our behavior what, 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 why would the land be under judgment is an individual well, thing we're referring to the land we're i guess yes. we're not looking at specifically as the right your land but the land mm -hmm. referring to us as a people okay so you're so what, what would happen to america they would have adopted the same stance. And they would be under judgment too. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they have more greater violence than Jamaica. They are the most violent country in the world, just that they don't um, release those figures. Um, there is also South Africa. There is Sweden, where there is not much violence, but sex and the, the loose morality is, is so evident. What happens then? So in effect, what you're saying is that the whole world would be under judgment. Yes. To, to, yes, to an extent. Yeah, but the Bible and, never tells us that. God no, never promised the world judgment until after the second coming. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so, so how would the world be under judgment now? When, uh, when you say under judgment, we are referring to the state of being as it stands now with our no because you said that we're so violent we would be under judgment mm -hmm. right we would be judged now i'm saying with the rest of the world meeting that same condition basically it means that everybody in the world or every country in the world almost would be in judgment okay but god never promised any judgment like that Okay, so so theoretically, then the the statement was a direct response to Solomon's. Yes, it is. That. The context tells us that. The passage tells us that. Everything within it tells us that he's speaking to Solomon. Okay. And you see, not only that, the land was specific. It wasn't general land. It wasn't somewhere here, there, and everywhere. It was specific. And it was specific to its place over there in Palestine. 
Okay. Very specific. God told them which borders he would be giving them from this border to that border. And he was very specific in which tribe should occupy um, what area and all of that. So then it would mean then if that promise was to us, then we should be in a place where we are occupying those same places. Okay. It was not general um, promise of land. It was a specific era that God says, this is where you're going to be. Okay, so so we should allow that statement to remain as applicable to the Israelites. Well, yeah. In, okay. Yes. All right. Um, I will rest that for now. So I'll, I'll pick you up on the <laughs> second question then. <laughs> um, I'm not being... Um, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So my second question, and this is a topic we have discussed here in this Bible study before. You refer to the temple being rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And I do know that there is a small sect within There's a small Israel, what? Israel sect or group or whatever faction within Israel that are planning to rebuild the temple the third time. They call it third temple. And they're also planning to reinstitute sacrifices. But we have been taught that this will not happen. We, I can't, I can't have it. You have the call at what? We have been taught that this will not happen. By whom? I uh, need to be careful here. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in this Bible study. If I, I, I will call a name, but I'm, I need to research to make sure I'm accurate. Mm -hmm. Rev. Pastor Mark does in a discussion with us we raised this topic and I asked specifically about the reintroduction of animal sacrifices by Israel mm -hmm. that's going to happen and, in um in the in the, 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 the when when God comes and he's ruling over the earth there will be a reinstitution of yes. animal sacrifices mm -hmm. Zachariah Israel. tells us that Okay. Uh, we're in Zechariah. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'll give it to you in a little while. Um, no problem. Uh, Zechariah 6, verse 15. Okay. All right. I will rest and then there's there. Daniel. Mm -hmm. When okay. Daniel giving you the times. So there will be a third temple, and yes, you say when mm -hmm. when God returns for His Earth, there will be a reason. Well, when God returns for the church, the church is then taken, and then there is going to be that period of time where um, the church, well, not the church, Israel, um, or the world will continue, and Israel will start moving towards fulfilling. All of those promises in, in Matthew chapter 25. Okay. Okay. See? Mm -hmm. And then um, after all of that, God will come and he will, he will, um, Jesus will come and he will reign over the earth for a thousand years. And during that time, the temple is going to be rebuilt. Okay. But if you All read right. Daniel chapter 9, 24 and 27, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Rick. And then there's Matthew 24, verse 15. Okay. All right. I will I will rest it there for now. You can mm -hmm. continue if anyone else wants to, to contribute. Thanks. Revelation 11, 2. There are several passages that, that tells you that the temple is going to be rebuilt. And it has to be because the land is not fully, the, the land, Israel has to occupy the land because God gave them that promise. So they will come again to occupy the land. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. All right. There's another there's hand a, up. There's a, really. Okay. There's the next hand up. Yes, Brother, okay. Herbin. Brother Herbin, please. 
Go ahead. Mr. Willis, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Willis he might have changed his mind. His hand. Okay. Mm. okay. Um... The relationship with God the Father is different. God is, God is never presented as an individual, as a father of individual Israelites in the Old Testament. He's a father of the nation, never individual. God is presented as a father of all New Testament believers. The promise is different too, because if you read it, it says, and... um. And you are hearers of God, joint hearers. We are sons of God, and as sons of God, we are hearers of God, and we are joint hearers with Jesus. So there's a distinction in how God relates to the church as opposed to Israel. Um, Romans 8, verse 15. I hope you write down these verses. And 1 John 3, 1. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. That's the promise to the church. Israel is now under God's judgment. Romans 10, 21 and 11, verse 8. To Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and, and contrary people, just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they could, should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Romans 10, 21 and 11, verse 8. They are under God's judgment. The church is free from all present judgment. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. So the church is free from judgment. Israel was God's servant. But you, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, who I have chosen, descendants of Abraham, my friend. Israel, I mean, Isaiah 4, 41, verse 8. The church, again, each born-again believer is God's son. Mr. Willis, go ahead. Mr. Willis? Okay. The church, every born again believer is God's son. John 1, 12, 1 John 3, 1. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the authority to become sons of God, to those who believe in his name. The relationship is different. Israel is pictured as an unfaithful wife. Um, and this is found in Hosea 2, 1 to 23, Jeremiah 3, verse 1, and 14, 20, Isaiah 54, 1 to 17. Am I going too fast? Hello? 
Hello? A, a little bit uh, when yeah. you're giving the Bible references, but other than that. All right. I think somebody has a hand up, Pastor. I, I yeah, I keep asking, but he's not responding. No, Conrad. I think Conrad has a hand. Yeah. Brother Willis seems to have him sometimes. Right. I, uh, I can't um, see Conrad. I, I don't see him. Uh, um, I Willis. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Conrad. Yes, um, I appreciate the pace at which you're going, and I want to thank you very much for your, your depth of knowledge. And I'm trying to use it to kind of realign my own perspective. So when yes. you speak about judgment <sighs> and the church, a verse that came to mind is First Peter 4, 17. If you could help me to understand that verse in the context of your statement that you just made. For the First time it's come that four. judgment must begin at the house of God. Yes. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end be of them that will be in the gospel? So I'm just trying to interpret what you just said, that the church is free from judgment. So if you could help me to just clarify my understanding or interpretation of that verse in Peter, sir. I'm coming one second. First Peter 4 and what? Hello? 17. 17. 17. I haven't read the full context. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Um, first Peter 4, 17. Um, this is not judgment like uh, judgment like what Israel faced. This is uh, individuals at time will face um, will face the the consequences of sin. We can't face judgment like them that ends in condemnation. Why? Because Christ already was judged in our place for all of our sins. But our sins can carry actions. When, for example, let me give you one case where there is judgment. In um, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, um, when it talks about when they came together, to break bread. You remember that passage? And when they came, those who had didn't share with those who didn't have. And so when they came, they had this feast um, that was called a love feast before the communion service. And the, the haves didn't share with the, the have-nots. And as a result of that, there was division in the church. When they came to the communion service, some came very hungry and they were eating the communion like regular food, breaking off big chunks of bread and drinking goblets of wine. And Paul chastised them for that and said, you must eat at your house. And to those others, he rebuked them because they were gluttonous. They ate till they were overfilled and all of that. And what he warned them about, when we read that passage, we very often tell people, um, we must be careful how we break the bread if there's sin in our lives and that sort of thing. The Bible is not talking about general sin, but the specific sin there so was one whereby love was not being displayed to each other. And God says, for this reason, many of you are sick and some sleep. So that kind of instantaneous move against people who are disobedient. Um, and that is because of the, the consequence for them being that way, because they are again um, despoiling the, the breaking of the bread. So Peter was talking more or less in that. And he says, if, if believers are judged for in this way, for those kind of things, how much more the world is going to face judgment? He's warning them that... Um, it will they, they will not escape judgment. See, um, he's warning them. It's time for judgment to begin. And this judgment sometimes is it is we who need to look at ourselves and start 
aligning ourselves with, 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 with what God says. So, no, the judgment of Israel is different. Israel wasn't judged individually. Israel was judged as a nation. This judgment that Peter talks about is individual believers for whatever they do. And it is dealt with, but it is not a judgment that brings them into condemnation. But in another passage, that same word judgment is translated discipline. Whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. Hello? Thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, is that okay with you? Yes, thank you, Pastor. All right. Uh, Israel is pictured as an unfaithful wife. The church is pictured as a chaste, virgin bride yet to be married in heaven. Um, and and that is that is one of the things that we read in in Matthew, and very often that is again misapplied when God talks about that's where the, the, the bridegroom comes and the marriage feast is on and those who he have locked out um, those who were invited to the to the, the marriage feast and all of that and the, the virgin bride there in that story we don't it is not mentioned is a church um, is never mentioned the bride is the one thing that that's not mentioned in the story because the bride is already with the bridegroom. That was the tradition then. And then he was warning Israel um, that many of them will not be, um, because of their unpreparedness, would not enter. Uh, so that is 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Revelation 19, 7 to 9. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. I'll start re repeating them so you can write them. Revelation 19, 7 to 9. Christ was a stumbling stone to Israel. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23, 1 Peter 2, verse 8. And Christ is the foundation and the chief cornerstone of the church. And that's Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. And 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5. The role that Christ play is different. Christ is Israel's Messiah and King. John 1 verse 49. And this is Nathaniel who responds to him and says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Um, we just celebrated Palm Sunday, the presentation of the king that Daniel wrote about in chapter um, 9. And all of that, um, when Jesus came riding into the, to the city on an ass, and people think Jesus has been very humble. No, Jesus, in fact, was presenting himself as king. When a king would come to offer peace, he would ride a donkey. When, king come, when a king would come to wage war, he would be on a horse. We see that in Revelation. Um, Revelation, is it 19 or 21? When Christ comes, he's on a horse because the mission is different. No, he came to offer peace. So he rode on a donkey and is being presented to Israel as her king and is being rejected by Israel soon after. Um, the church, Christ is the church's savior. The bridegroom and head of the church. Ephesians 5, verse 23. When the Bible, when Paul is writing and he's saying husband is the head of wife and he outlays the relationship. And um, even though it can be used for teaching um, a biblical model for 
Christians in relationship, Paul ends by saying, I am not talking about a husband and a wife, but I'm talking about the church and Christ. So Christ is seen different as he is to the, to the church than he is to Israel. The relation to the Holy Spirit is different. The Holy Spirit rarely came upon individual Old Testament Israelites. Rarely. And when he came, it was not permanently. So you have um, David. When David had sinned, he pleads and he says, do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. You remember that? It's a different relationship. The Holy Spirit never came permanently. As a matter of fact, um, the, the prophet um, said that it would be in the last days that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, which marked the beginning of the church. And Peter declared that in Acts 2, Joel the prophet, when he quoted him and say, this is a fulfillment of that. The church has the Holy Spirit permanently. The Holy Spirit, and the moment the church, you are born again, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells in you bodily until the day of redemption. So there is a different relationship. And hence we get the, 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 the term that we so love to use now in church, anointing. And we need the anointing for this and we need the anointing for that and there's the anointing. The anointing came at that time because there was not a permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit would come upon um, those whom he chose for specific tasks and empower them to carry it out. The church is always anointed because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And empowers us to do all things that is needed and that is godly. The Bible says it that um, that we have been um, empowered to do all that we need to live godly is already given to us. So we don't need to ask God for an anointing. And I, people say that to me all the time. And I get in trouble when I tell these things. Because you know, people start to get upset and say, what are you talking about? I know about anointing. I pray and I get the anointing. You didn't get any anointing. We are anointed the moment we believe the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us and empowers us. Empowers us. And that's why when we get over to, if um thing there, it says, um, that we must we must be filled with the spirit because the spirit is subject to the prophet spirit of god is subject to how we respond so it says be ye filled with the holy spirit what does that mean we must be under the control of the holy spirit so it means we yield our own authority to the Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can work in and through us. But we don't need to be praying about anointing. God has already empowered us. So. Sorry, Rev. Uh, Brother Willis has put his hand up and he is on mute at this whose time. Whose hand is up? Irvin Willis, Brother Willis. Okay. Good night, everyone. Hi, right, Mr. Willis, you're finally able to, to yeah. answer to the hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, good night. Yeah, I'm having a bit of concern here with some of what is being um, said. That, was, um, part, that verse in Chronicles, I don't know. I, 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 that was something that I hinged faith on, my faith on. You, know, you, you hinge know, your I, faith on that? On that, so, that sort of thing, that being... How you should you, you should operate if your if his people is called that is called by his name and so on, and you know that's all I think. And then um, I'm hearing that is not for this time and so on. I'm not sure. I just yeah, want but to... if you just need to go back and read it, who was he talking to, and what was the promise being made to? 
So who, um, well, so what was happening there is not expected to happen now. It can't be because we don't have a Solomon, one. We don't have a king who reigns over the church, two. The church don't have a land promise, so which land is going to get judged or blessed? The church is people made up from different lands. Mm -hmm. The church is, is, is universal. Yeah. Israel and, and, and is specific to the nation of Israel. Mm. Everything that is being, um, that was said then, is ought to be taken literally. What about even, well, I even listened and, uh, you know. For the, the most part, you know, unless the Bible says otherwise, it is to be accepted literally. Mm. What about the, 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 par the parables uh, that Jesus spoke of? Mm -hmm. About the, the um, <clears throat> 10 versions and some were yeah. locked out. Yes. Um, you it's know, not a parable. That's not a parable. What was it? That, that, um, was an answer in relation to what the disciples asked him when they said to him, mm. when will these things be and right. what shall be the signs? So he's giving them a sign. Uh -huh. Right. It was, he was referencing the situation. What situation? No, the, the situation with, with, with the unpreparedness of, of those, um, those who were locked out. Mm -hmm. But that was not the church. The church no, cannot be locked out. No, because if the church is the bride of Christ. These were virgins. They were attendants to the bride. Right. Mm. So, so where's I, the bride in the story? You never hear the bride mentions. You know why? Because the bride is already with the groom. Yeah. If the if the groom came and locked the bride out, who was he going to get married to? No, I'm not, uh, what I'm seeing you know, is that how I was seeing it mm. is that people who are unprepared, that is, they're, they're going to um, face that sort of disappointing situation. And who would that be? be locked out. Who would that be? Anybody who is unprepared. <laughs> but we know that the people who are unprepared um, then um, in reference to Israel. And this is why Paul writes in, 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 in Romans and says, um, not everybody who is born in of Abraham's seed is a seed is of the promise. Mm -hmm. So there's an open invitation to all of Israel. By the way, um, the person who gets saved today right. is not the, the Jewish believer is a part of the church. Mm -hmm. He falls in line with the promises of the church, the call of the church. I'm hearing you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So so go ahead. So that that call, that was the, the bride was with the groom who comes. This is a wedding that is taking place. And he is inviting many, but not many are prepared to come. And they are lost. They have been locked out. Yeah. But the church can't be locked out. The church is raptured. Okay. There's a lot of, lot, lot of um, discussions that I would really like to uh, be engaged in this because I'm having a, a, a bit of um, struggle. Yeah. I understand that clearly. As I said, my first assignment in school was to write on the distinctions between the church and Israel. And up until that time, I've never heard any such thing. Mm -hmm. I almost got up in class and said to the professor, blasphemy. <laughs> but but um, the more I studied, the more I wrote, the more I um, did Bible courses, the more I discovered that God is distinctly different. It's one is with an old covenant, a people who abided on the law, a people who did um certain rituals and, and practices that pointed to Christ and his coming. Um, Colossians 2 says all of that. And now um that Christ is here, all these things have been fulfilled, all of those things have passed away. See, so there are distinctions between the two. Like I try to tell people, um, when people talk about things, and I'm not going to even say it, I can't think I've been controversial enough for one night, so I'll leave out that part. But um, there are things that people 
try to point to the New Testament in the Gospels and say, well, see there, it's here. Of course it is. But the Gospels are written under the time of the Old Testament. The church begins in Acts 2. The church is promised. I will build my church. Not I have built my church. I will build my church. So the church is future, and the future is in Acts 2. Yes, Conrad, your hand is still up? It's gone up again, sir. Okay. Um, mm. I, I just We just need to be clear in our takeaways from this interesting encounter. Because if we're not listening keenly, some of us might believe that, okay, the Bible in of itself is a historical book. And the Old Testament is really speaking of a relative history to the New Testament. And so and since the Old Testament and everything has been fulfilled in Christ, we no longer need to read it. Because that's no, a history that's not book. That's true. Because then, the New Testament saying, is predicated so, on the Old Testament. Right. So I have to so, be careful. Um, you know, it's, get it's those, what you're seeing from Genesis through um, to Malachi is God's plan being unveiled to the place where he redeems man and, and man is brought back into relationship with him. That's what you see from Genesis to Malachi, to, 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 to the Gospels. After the Gospels, there now is reconciliation. There's the establishment of a new covenant. The old covenant, if there's a new covenant, then the old covenant cannot be in vogue. For example, if we have a law that has been changed or has been replaced by another law, we can't very well try to meet the standards of the whole old law and the new law. There's a new covenant. And this new covenant now tells us how we should then live being the church in Christ. And we can't keep reaching back. In Colossians um, 2, he said, um, warning them, you 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 cannot stand on the traditions. You see, the bad teaching was that there was Gnosticism and there was the 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 traditions of the the Jewish people that they were now bringing on into the church. Remember, Peter had a a falling out with Paul about the same thing. So. So my other my concern, you see, is that as people after Christ, a necessary component that is vital for our existence is that thing called faith, mm -hmm. without which is impossible to please God. Yeah, and that we should endeavor to even have a mustard seed of it. Okay, so, so let me I ask you one no... question. I see another hand going up, but let me yeah. ask you quickly, and then I go to the other hand. How do we have faith? Well, personally, I have to consciously try to tell myself and convince myself that what I read is applicable, that Christ exists. When I read it in the word, it is true, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's almost like going to the gym. I have to exercise it. I have to try to cultivate it and grow it because it does not come automatically as breathing. Okay. And so a verse like Second Chronicles I don't see it as a physical land, and boy, it can be, the land is going to be fertile, so anything a plant will grow. I see it just as how the parables speak about, you know, earthly things with heavenly meanings, just as how it speaks about but it's, it but, 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 the it, Old but Testament. you can't do that because it was an historical event. That's to what I'm say saying. that is to say that this never really happened. This is just a story. But the I'm trying to answer your question. Are not about necessarily how I feed are my not faith. anything that happened. It's just a story or an illustration that God uses to teach a truth. And this I accept is that, historical. You know, I accept its roots and relevance in history, but I also recognize that we serve a God who transcends history and time. And so I see the parallel between a nation that had rebelled against God and had been enduring the consequences and seeing a nation that when they come in obedience and repentance, they receive the blessing. Choose you this day who you may serve. Yeah, but serve. where, where so did I God ever that. call a nation in the New Testament? 
Well, I am now seeing parallels. For example, we are called a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are not going to be like the guy who wears a robe and has all those drills on the breastplate and all those things and goes in and offers sacrifice because what he's talking about is really a matter of our relationship with Christ. What but he's was talking about is that physical we tent. no longer need somebody to do all of these things, but we have now been made priests. Yes, but I'm saying references so, so, to that, that but, helps but, my but, faith. But, but yeah, but, but the priest function is not there anymore. Are you sacrificing anything? Ah, a living sacrifice. I am now a living no, sacrifice. No, no, that's that is your well, lifestyle. Claim. That is what you're called to do. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, I but see then, the when, when Paul talks about a living sacrifice, Paul not telling you you must kill yourself on an altar. Paul is telling you that your lifestyle must be one that is subdued and submitted to God. In so other you words, can't Christ, use, you can't just very well twist anything you see. It's to make not it twist, but extrapolating to see the meaning. So no, when you Christ... can't extrapolate when there is distinct, there's a distinct context that explains it. You recall Christ healing on the Sabbath and picking corn on the Sabbath? These were rooted in physical, established, documented laws. And he right. came to lift their level of understanding to show, listen, this is bigger than just legalistically abiding by the letters of the law. No, but he did more than that. He fulfilled the law. The law condemned everybody to death. And he fulfilled the mandate of the law by dying. And that's why you, as a believer now, are baptized into his death the moment you believe and resurrected into his life. It means that in you, the law has been fulfilled also. I'm going to defer to the other hands, but I am yes. being very careful to guard my embryonic faith. So I don't wiggle it away because I said, but all these things you've been believing and using to grow your faith and believing that miracles are going to happen. Do so. I you expect know? you to have a burying spirit. <laughs> what I want you to do is go back and read and see what the Bible says. I understand you, sir. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, pastor, pastor, two, mm -hmm. two things. Um, the discussions we're having here warrant more than one evening's <laughs> delving into this context. Seriously, because as well, Conrad just explained that a lot of us hold on to some of these teachings personally. And when we are hearing that the, the foundations on which we stand were incorrect, it poses certain problems in our own understanding of where, who we are. So I think we really need to go a little bit more than just brushing the surface. It causes discomfort doing that. Well, I'm sure your pastor going to take you up on, on the rest. Yeah, yeah man, he probably will. But mm -hmm. my second statement is not really a question, it's a nice statement, because I've been in a study before, and maybe a lot of persons have not come to a midday Bible study, where we were, in fact, reminded that a lot of what is spoken of in the, in the Gospels are interpreted in in view of the hebrew traditions of the day yeah so it was old testament yeah not just the old testament i'm talking like in, in the new testament in the gospel where we are talking about the church being the bride a lot of us tend to forget or are not aware that in hebrew traditions the bridegroom actually takes the bride before he comes to the ceremony right because in our context the groom stands in the church waiting right. for the bride to come. Right. So we will have a difference of understanding based on that. Right. I did mention that, that the bride is not mentioned and why she's not mentioned because she's already with the bridegroom. Yeah, that's a statement, but we don't understand that it is actually how the whole Hebrew tradition was structured. That mm, the bride the culture, would have, the bride that's how they have, operated, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just saying that would have caused a lot of concern for some persons hearing this yeah. teaching. But unfortunately, I had an hour. I was trying to get you through this in an hour. Not Never possible. worked. I know it wouldn't. <laughs> but I'm sure your pastor will pick up on other remaining factions that that are factors that demonstrate the difference between the church and Israel. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
any other question because it's now 9.13. So any other question? All right, just one thing in closing. Teachings like this is going to always create um, this kind of struggle. Why? Because as I've said before, it is not things that are taught normally in church. There are a lot of things that we have not touched on as a church. And as a result of that, people are not informed. So their faith um, is hinged on wrong principles. Not that they have lost anything, um, but they would have misplaced their faith by requiring a lot of other things and wanting a lot of other things. When the Bible is very clear that you don't need that because that is there or this no longer prevails. Over to you, Miss Burton. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. 